Central Bank's Role in Development Preamble and Ramblings So, I've got some feedback over the course of running the channel that a lot of the time I explain things in an overly technical and not entirely comprehensible way. So I'm going to try and slow down a little bit more and explain stuff at a bit of a slower pace. I came across a book recently by Randall Monroe, the guy who writes the XKCD comics. The book was called Thing Explainer and was an attempt to explain complex scientific ideas in a jargon free way using only the 10,000 most common English words. It came across as quite a fun idea, if perhaps a bit of a gimmick, and I thought I would give it a shot to explain economic concepts. However, my issue with this approach is that introducing jargon is often useful if people want to read further on topics I introduce in my videos, or just link up what I'm saying with other things they know about the field. And in isolation, it works a bit like Newspeak from 1984, although a more positive analogy, which I think Newspeak was actually based on, would be Esperanto. So, what I'm going to try to do is alternate between the two, explaining things in both ways where I feel it would make things more understandable. The simplified version is obviously going to be a bit of a crude approximation of my actual point, but hopefully it will be a useful one. The main topic this video is going to cover is the historical role many central banks have played in development and how this differs from the current Washington consensus of what central banks are supposed to do. I'm looking at what central banks used to do to help countries grow and how important people say central banks should be doing things differently now. I'm going to be basing this on a 2006 paper by Gerald Epstein. So it may not be entirely up to date with current trends, but I think it does provide a useful 101. What is a central bank? Central banks were initially private, for-profit banks, which became more and more integrated with the state over time. States granted some banks specific privileges and monopolies in exchange for cheap access to credit and over time a closer relationship between the state and the central bank formed and the policy goals and instruments of central banks were gradually transformed more and more both from the typical actions of a for-profit bank and from many of the original policy roles of the central bank to ones more in line with neoliberal policy. Basically central banks began as normal banks which became more and more joined with the state over time States gave some of the normal states gave some of the normal banks trying to make money special powers in exchange for borrowing money cheaply. Over time, these banks became part of the state and they slowly changed what they were trying to do and how they were trying to do it. They acted less and less like normal banks which tried to make money, but also the way they acted as part of the state changed as many early things they did are now forgotten or looked down on. A central bank can have several main functions, and in many countries historically only performed a limited set of all these functions. Which functions is most important to decide if something is a central bank proper or not is a matter of debate. Common functions are 1. Unifying and issuing a country's currency. two acting as the government's bank. 3. Acting as commercial banks' banks. 4. Serving as a lend of last resort to the banking or financial sector. 5. Conducting monetary policy to manage the foreign exchange and price levels. 6. Conducting monetary policy to manage overall levels of economic activity. and 7. Allocating credit to promote national goals. Hmm. In addition, though less often discussed, central banks can have effects on income distribution, national sovereignty, and affect which industries get credit and at what cost. Neoliberal best practice suggests that central banks should focus only on a very few of the roles above, mostly price stability.
So, central banks can do a lot of stuff. And at any one time, in any one country, the central bank only does some of this stuff. The things which important people think are good for central banks to do make it difficult for poor countries to become richer. And it is not what helped rich countries grow when they were still poor. How did central banks help with development? Government Finance The Bank of England was created in 1694 during a war with France to directly finance the English government by granting a bunch of legal privileges to a private banking corporation. This arrangement later helped finance many other British military campaigns, including the Napoleonic Wars. Many other central banks have played similar roles in directly financing governments, including banks in the US, France, Belgium, Spain and Germany. Nowadays, it is considered very bad form for central banks to directly finance government spending in this way. Foreign Exchange Control Under the gold standard in Europe, central bank policies were rather limited in terms of what policies they could adopt, either to influence the exchange rate or trade patterns more generally. Nevertheless, they did pursue a number of policies which offered slightly greater flexibility and try and adopt mercantilist policies to increase their stock of precious metals and improve their trade position, such as in the choice of which precious metals the central bank used, gold as in the British case, or a bimetallist system of both gold and silver with a fixed exchange rate set between the two as used in France. Central Banks in the Developed World When central banks still operated as commercial banks, they often lent to many private firms, but at a subsidised rate, afforded to them by the security and special rights they had as the central bank. States with central banks tended to have lower interest rates than those without. These banks didn't really act like actual public development banks in the modern developmental state sense, but they did provide cheaper and larger volumes of credit than other sources of credit at the time. Older central banks tried to make money by lending to companies, and they could do this more cheaply than other banks because they had the state to support them, and because they had more money so they weren't putting all their eggs in one basket when they made larger loans to companies. But they were doing this to make money themselves. National development objectives were just a happy accident of this. During the Second World War, central banks played a direct role in financing government spending, and afterwards also helped stabilise the market for government debt accumulated during the war. I should probably clarify this now that rather than government debt being like one large account with a central bank that they own credit in, government debt is more commonly created as tradable financial assets called government bonds, which promise to pay whoever owns the bonds a certain amount after a certain amount of time at a rather low interest rate. So if the central bank is stabilising the market for government debt, it means that it is buying and selling these bonds in financial markets in such a way that their price remains relatively stable. In the post-war Keynesian period, central banks were given several policy objectives in addition to price stability, such as promoting full employment and high levels of investment. Central banks were involved in controlling the cost and availability of credit for a number of reasons. Giving low interest loans to governments to control the quantity of credit without changing interest rates, to coordinate other monetary policies, and to make other price controls more palatable by limiting interest rates. Basically, central banks lent money cheaply to companies which the state thought were useful to help the economy grow. In England, this was used to promote exports, make imports more expensive 
and discourage too much finance from going to consumption. In France, Italy and Belgium, cheap credit allocation was used to modernize the economy and increase international competitiveness in strategic sectors. These were often more effective when widespread to stop avoidance, i.e. if the government tries to stop finance going into a real estate bubble, but do so by issuing only a minimal or vague set of regulations, then these people may soon find a way to work around restrictions. These policies can also be supported by policy tools to stop capital flight. If a central bank keeps interest rates low so that real investment is cheap, then people who will want to, will want to take their money offshore to get higher interest. These rules began to be dismantled with the shift to neoliberalism in the 1980s. Increasing inflation in the 1980s meant that central banks in England and the US shifted focus almost entirely to reducing inflation, and interest rates were raised substantially. Public spending and investment fell in general, and exchange controls were largely replaced in most countries with floating exchanges, shaping and constraining the policy options available to central banks. Despite the success of previous policy regimes, these new neoliberal policies were seen as a more modern and superior version of central banking and became heavily promoted by international organisations. In the current neoliberal model, there is a very limited role which central banks can play directly in development. Instead, markets are thought of as the most efficient way to direct investment, and more direct intervention simply creates distortions. Instead, a best practice is preached which involves simply maintaining macroeconomic stability as the primary and only goal of the central bank. So, basically, people now think that central banks can't do much to help countries develop. They also think that investment is best done by companies and normal for-profit banks, and markets for financial assets. In this view, central banks should just be there to make sure inflation is stable, but this ignores how central banks have been important in the past. Central Banking in Developing Countries Central banks played an even larger direct role in financing government projects and strategic sectors in developing countries. Many of these were actually encouraged by the US Federal Reserve Bank, i.e. the US Central Bank, to use a wide range of policies to aid in development along with the more traditional roles of price and exchange stabilization. Often, direct investment was not done directly by central banks, but rather through loans to other separate public development banks. By the 1970s, there was growing scepticism about these policies, even by more pro-Keynesian officials, and discussion that there were mixed results on the effectiveness of these policies, and that these policies inhibited the capacity of the central banks to achieve the more important functions of ensuring macroeconomic stability. Basically, most people were saying that central banks can't control inflation, exchange and interest rates if it is also to be involved in trying to actually stimulate or help grow the economy. However, industrial policy and developmental state advocates, such as Alice Amsden, argue that this state-led mobilization of finance for industrialization was an important part of many countries' successful development. As well as specific sectoral policies, these countries also adopted general low interest rates and exchange rate controls. These policies certainly had their complications and downsides, but they did help finance significant development.